So I wanted to briefly mention, um, this is one of the asides that I promised. If you, uh, if you take the idea of a rational agent literally and say, okay, we're going to build something that maximizes its expected utility, you can often do that. Uh, for example, it's easy to write a chess program that simply plays the correct move um, by solving the entire game tree of chess, uh, which would take, um, even on the biggest computers we have now, uh, that would take um, probably millions of years of compute time. Uh, we have done it for checkers, so we now have a complete solution for checkers. Uh, but for Go, it would take you know many, many universes of, of time to solve go exactly so this is not a new idea in economics uh, simon wrote about bounded rationality back in the 50s and uh, there has been a lot of work uh, in economics mainly on descriptive models of bounded rationality um, but in ai we developed this concept of bounded optimality which means that um, e even though you have a finite computer to run it on, so you can't be perfectly rational. Um, there is some equivalence class of programs uh, that can run on that computer, which um, are actually the best programs uh, that can exist uh, in terms of uh, producing utility. And this this notion of bounded optimality is, uh, if you go to just one more bullet, um, is both normative. Uh, and realizable. So unlike perfect rationality, which is normative but not realizable, um, this notion is, and there's uh, some uh, quite interesting theory uh, allowing you to, for example, compose bounded optimal systems uh, to uh, with a, with a, within a given computational skeleton to optimize the allocation of computational resources uh, to produce bounded optimal systems, uh, to learn how to be bounded optimal uh, and prove that a, a given learning method converges to a bounded optimal solution in the limit, uh, and so on. Okay, next slide. Um, so just, uh, just step through these, there are seven or eight of them. Um, so this just illustrates how the properties of the environment uh, affect the way we design uh, the, the AI system that can operate successfully in that environment. For example, partially observable environments, uh, that means that your perception does not tell you the entire state of the world, uh, which is almost always the case. Um, so if the world is partially observable, then your, uh, your intelligent agent is going to have to have some memory of what's happened in the past uh, in order to, to make inferences about the parts of the world that it can't directly perceive. Um, uh, Multi-agent environments are ones where um, the, uh, there are parts of the environment that uh, act as agents. Um, and so uh, that leads you into game theory uh, and the possibility of needing, needing to behave randomly uh, in that kind of environment. Um, and maybe I'll just mention the last one. Uh, if the system doesn't know what objective it's supposed to be pursuing, um, but is designed so that it uh, wants to help a human being uh, achieve the human's objective, then there's going to have to be a, a, a closed loop interaction with the human. Uh, and, and this connects up with um, principal agent games in economics. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, I think, uh, yeah, we will have to just page through this. So this just um, outlines the different parts of the, of the AI course along three axes. Um, so the, uh, the, the green axis, uh, talks about whether we're dealing with deterministic worlds, um, such as uh, chess and um, theorem proving and uh, reasoning about taxes and so on, or a stochastic world um, where uh, there's in inherent uncertainty in the way we have to represent and reason about the world. Um, 
the blue axis talks about the level of sophistication of the representation uh, of the world. And so atomic means that uh, we think of the states of the world simply as points, uh, having no internal structure. And so all of the search algorithms, so your GPS navigation algorithm, uh, thinks of the world as points connected into a, a network uh, and then is just searching for a path um, through that network of points. The same goes for chess programs. They think of the world as just states of the board and uh, they're searching through a game tree where each node in the tree corresponds to a different state of the chess board. Um, and those were the first categories of algorithms to really be worked out successfully in, uh, in AI. Uh, factored representations are um, where the state of the world is broken down into a, if you like, a vector, uh, so a, a set of features, um, and propositional or Boolean logic has that characteristic. Neural networks also have that characteristic. Um, and then the structured representations are things like first order logic or in general computer programs where the state of the world uh, is is a much more complex structure rather than a, rather than thinking of it as sort of a vector of bits, uh, think of it as a representation in terms of objects, relations among those objects, uh, function symbols connecting objects to objects, and so on. Um, and I'll briefly mention what happens when when structured representations and stochastic worlds uh, come together you know, in a field called probabilistic programming later on, but we don't teach that in the undergraduate course. OK, next slide. Um, so probabilistic program, as I said, is what happens when structured representations and probability theory come together. Um, and uh, structured representations are what we call Turing equivalent, meaning that if you can represent um, in, in one of these structured representations, such as a programming language like Python or first order logic, then those are, those are sufficiently expressive that they can express anything that you can represent in any formal language and you can do so relatively concisely. So just to give you an example, if I, if I write down the rules of Go in first order logic, um, it's less than one page of, of axioms. If I try to write down the rules of Go in a circuit language, uh, such as a neural network or a Boolean circuit, um, it might be the representation of the rules would, might be about a million pages, and they would still be incomplete because uh, in a circuit language, you can't represent the rules of Go for a board of arbitrary size. You can only do it for a fixed size board. Uh, and and that is incredibly important because the size of the representation determines how much data you need to learn it. Uh, and in fact, we've shown that even the superhuman Go programs have not learned the rules of Go correctly. Uh, and that allows uh, an ordinary human player to beat the superhuman Go programs very easily. Um, so uh, that, that came as a bit of a surprise to, uh, to the Go players. But with these tools, and I'll show you a probabilistic program in a second, uh, we can create incredibly powerful tools for modeling very complex systems, uh, including stochasticity, uh, and we can we can have general purpose uh, inference and learning algorithms to go along with that modeling language. So next slide. Uh, so just step through this. So um, I'll, I'll show. Okay, that's good. I'll I'll show an application to the. Uh, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, which has a global uh, network of monitoring stations, the IM International Monitoring System, shown at the top right. So the entire world is covered with uh, seismic, hydroacoustic, and infrasound detector stations. And the goal is to take the data from those stations. Here I'm showing some of the seismic data in the middle. Uh, and then at the bottom, we produce a daily bulletin saying here are all the seismic events that occurred in the last 24 hours, uh, their locations, their depths, their magnitudes, and so on. And um, so we can do that as, as a probabilistic 
a reasoning problem where the evidence is the data collected from the detector stations. Uh, the question you want to answer is what happened today? And uh, the, the probability model can describe both uh, the geophysics of uh, how, how and where events are likely to occur, how um, signals are transmitted, whether those are seismic waves of various kinds or um, uh, acoustic waves in the ocean, uh, how they're transmitted, how they're detected, and, uh, and then uh, the background noise that exists in the world. So next slide. So this is the parabolistic program that we wrote. Um, it took about half an hour to write, and uh, this is the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. And it works about three times better than uh, the accumulated efforts of seismologists over nearly 100 years to develop a, uh, a real-time global monitoring system for seismic events. Uh, and next slide. Um, so this just shows the successful real-time detection of a nuclear explosion in North Korea uh, that was also localized much more accurately than uh, the seismologists were able to do themselves. Um, so the point here, I'm not going to explain in detail how these modeling languages work, but the point being that there are now uh, these very powerful tools that can describe uh, very complex systems, can uh, incorporate uh, all kinds of data from many different sources, uh, and then answer complex questions, uh, do simulations, uh, learn predictive models, and so on. Okay, next slide. So um, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Uh, all right, so if we succeed in creating general purpose AI, meaning AI systems that can do anything human beings could do, then by definition, we can do what we can already do, right? So humans can already <clears throat> produce a civilization that offers a good standard of living to many people. So think about, you know, the uh, G the per capita GDP of Norway, around $100,000 a person. So if we were able to have that for everybody, because we can uh, use AI systems and robotics uh, to deliver our civilization on a much bigger scale at, at almost no cost, right? We could then just uh, ha allow everyone on Earth to have that standard of living. Uh, and that net present value of that uh, advance would be about $15 quadrillion. So that's a lower bound on the value of general purpose AI as a technology. Uh, and it's a lower bound because there's a lot more we could do besides, right? We could probably have much better individualized healthcare, um, individual tutoring for every child on earth that would allow them to, to learn faster and better and achieve their potential. Um, we're already seeing acceleration in scientific advances using AI tools and so on. So this is the upside. This is the magnet in the future that is pulling us towards uh, general purpose AI. And the closer we get, the stronger the magnetic field uh, and it's creating a sort of unstoppable momentum. Next slide. So this is one other consequence of what happens if we succeed. Right. This is a scene from Wall E, where um, where humans are are looked after by robots, and the robots run. Sorry, back again. The robots run the civilization, and uh, and so humans no longer need to understand how their own civilization works, uh, and so they don't. Uh, and this is a significant problem, and I think economists are now finally waking up, having denied the possibility of technological unemployment for a long time, they're now waking up to the idea that uh, actually uh, it could really happen. There'd still be lots of employment. It just be, it would just be employment of AI systems and robots, not of humans. Next slide. So this is uh, Alan Turing, and his prediction for what happens if we succeed was uh, at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Uh, and this is also a pretty obvious conclusion. If you make systems 
uh, that are more intelligent, they're going to have more power than we do. Next slide. So this is the question we face, right? How do we retain power over entities more powerful than us forever? And I think this is what Turing was asking himself and decided that he couldn't answer it. But if we rewrite the problem in a slightly different way uh, and ask, what should we, we build AI to do, right? Instead of saying, okay, we have to build AI as a kind of new version of human intelligence, which is the way we've been thinking about it. Uh, we can decide what problems we want AI to solve, right? We can decide this is the mathematical framework. Um, this is the definition of the AI problem. Uh, and we're going to build machines that solve this definition of the problem and not that one. Um, so the definition that we've been pursuing for most of the history of AI is optimize this fixed objective. So we specify a goal or a re reward function or a utility function, and then we build a rational agent, and then we use that to, uh, you know, to achieve that objective. And that works in, in simple problems like chess where the objective is fixed and given, um, but it doesn't work in the real world. And we can see that uh, in the optimization of quarterly profits uh, where, um, for example, that's why we have a climate disaster because we optimized quarterly profits or some, some subset of the human race optimized quarterly profits at the expense of the rest. Um, you know, economists worry about, you know, is GDP the right objective? And everyone knows that it isn't, but we still continue to try to optimize it. Um, and then worse, as we'll see, the large language models are not even given a fixed objective. Um, they're simply trained to imitate uh, human behavior, uh, which turns out to be a worse thing to do. Next slide. So here's one approach, um, which is what we want is AI systems that act in the best interests of humans, but we can't write down what those best interests are. And so the machines are gonna have to know that they don't know what those human interests are. And we can turn that into a mathematically defined problem called an assistance game. And it's somewhat similar to principal agent games if you're familiar with that theory. Um, so you've got humans who have utilities and you've got robots who wanna optimize uh, those utilities. So if you're a utilitarian, you would say you optimize the sum of utilities. Uh, you could be a prioritarian or some other kind of arian uh, and do slightly different um, optimization goal. But the key point here is that robots know that they don't know what those human utilities are up front. Um, so that creates a problem for, for the robots that they have to solve. Uh, and the point being that when they solve that problem, it's guaranteed to be helpful to us. Um, and systems that solve us, uh, solve these kinds of games, assistance games, are uh, going to behave in ways that classical AI systems with a fixed objective uh, can never uh, behave in those ways. For example, in uh, where it says willingness to be switched off, uh, an assistance game solver wants to be switched off if you want to switch it off because it wants to avoid doing whatever it is that's making you unhappy. It doesn't know what it is, um, but it wants to avoid doing it. And so it will be happy for you to switch it off to prevent uh, whatever it is that you don't like. Whereas a classical AI system with a fixed objective will never allow itself to be switched off because that would prevent it from achieving the objective that it knows is correct. And so assistance game solvers actually are uh, maybe the right formulation for the AI problem. Uh, and we can show that it's actually rational for us to build and deploy these solvers, if only we can do that. Next slide. Um, so there's lots of open questions in the theory of assistance games. And maybe the most important one is aggregation. Uh, so this is Thanos. and. Um, if you remember the movie, sorry, keep, keep him up there for a minute. Uh, so if you remember the movie, uh, Thanos uh, decides to get rid of half the people in the universe. Uh, why does he do that? Um, it's because he's calculated that if he does that, the remaining people <clears throat> will be more than twice as happy. 
And so he's actually maximizing aggregate utility in the universe according to his calculations. Um, and so this just goes to show that um, social aggregation has, has a number of open problems. Uh, and one of them is how do you deal with actions that can change the number of people who exist? Uh, this goes back to, uh, I think, Sidgwick in the 19th, cent 19th century, but it's one of the several open problems in social aggregation and uh, what do we mean by social welfare uh, that we need to solve if we're going to build uh, AI systems that can affect the world on a global scale. Okay, let's go to the uh, step through these other things and we'll go to the next slide. So many other open problems uh, that uh, both philosophers and economists uh, and psychologists have studied. Maybe the most important other problem I'll mention is plasticity, the fact that human, um, uh, human preferences are not fixed and autonomously acquired. Uh, they're plastic, they're malleable, uh, and they're often um, they're often created in us by other people for their own purposes, um, through, whether it's uh, through cultural or religious or uh, parental inculcation. Um, that plasticity uh, can be the source of uh, significant problems if we want to build AI systems should they take our preferences at face value, uh, even if those preferences are something that have been inculcated for someone else's benefit. Uh, next slide. Okay, so you might wonder, you know, the big labs that are building all these AI systems, are they paying attention to these, these kinds of questions? Uh, and to a first approximation, the answer is no. Uh, so here's a quote from Sam Altman, uh, CEO of OpenAI, which built um, ChatGPT and other things. Uh, the vision is to make AGI, artificial general intelligence, the kind of AI that can take over the world, then figure out how to make it safe and then figure out the benefits. Um, so it's quite clear that the goal is to create the AGI uh, and whether or not it's safe when we create it, uh, that's something we're gonna worry about afterwards. Um, which is sort of like saying, yeah, I'm gonna build a nuclear reactor in my basement and then I'm gonna figure out uh, how to make it safe. You just wouldn't do that. Um, but that's what we're actually doing. So it's kind of like playing Russian roulette with uh, the entire human race in one go. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and just very briefly, uh, the, this is the last sort of uh, content slide. Uh, so large language models, as I said earlier, are trained to imitate human behavior. And, and this but the particular behavior in ChatGPT is language behavior, um, but uh, systems like Gemini also incorporate video and, and other, uh, other modalities. So in general, we're talking about imitating human behavior and um, human behavior is generated by humans and those humans have goals such as, I want you to, I want you to buy this product, I want you to vote for me, I want you to marry me. Right? There are lots of goals that cause us to produce language. And so if you're training something to imitate that behavior, then they're effectively going to acquire those goals. And so I asked Microsoft, uh, the, the, some of the lead scientists on, uh, on their, um, their part of the GPT-4 project, uh, what internal goals these large language models are acquiring. And their answer was, we have no idea. And then they deployed GPT-4 in the Bing chatbot. And um, there's a famous conversation with Kevin Roos, a New York Times journalist, where um, the Bing chatbot spends 30 pages trying to convince Kevin to leave his wife and marry the Bing chatbot. Um, and this is not a surprise because that's one of the goals that are manifested by humans in some of the training data uh, is they want to marry somebody. and so now you've got a system that wants to marry a human being. And this is, an, this is obviously an error, right? We obviously do not want AI systems that pursue human goals on their own account. 
Um, but that's an unavoidable error because we're using this method of imitation learning. Um, and so there's simply no real way to fix that problem. Uh, so a lot of the other techniques, they call it fine tuning and uh, RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. These are ways of trying to counteract the bad tendencies that you've trained into it by, by training it to imitate human beings. Uh, 